I don't know how many years it's been since I've used this lap. Oh my goodness. Well, it's okay. smooth and, <laughs> and clear. That's, so Yeah, that's yeah, much way better. better. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Wow. I just learned something new. Thanks for teaching me that. No worries. Um, <laughs> it, that's contributing to all kinds of my computer problems right now. No, yeah. I'm curious how you guys got into this in terms of, it uh, looks like you've been doing this now a, a year-ish. Is yeah. that true? Yeah, we, we're a bit less than a year. We're like 32 weeks into it. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, Craig and I, uh, we're basically good mates. Um we met overseas through a, a mutual friend about three or four years ago, or actually five years ago, I think it was now in Ibiza, yeah. in Ibiza um, and literally hit it off from that, from the first time we met each other. And then um, just over the years, like after doing trips and things, we just were like, oh, yes, we've got to start a podcast because we just love talking. We love listening to podcasts. And then um, we just kicked it off. Like it was right, the right timing, sort of Craig, had moved to Australia. He'd just been there for a year or so. I had just left my job as a as an investment banker, and everything just kind of lined up. And um, you know, we just we we both really we both really like the same things, and we just connect a lot on on the same things. But we we do come from things from a different angle too, which just creates a nice sort of mix, um, mm. you know, for the podcast in terms of you know. What, how we ask things and whatnot, and just really works well. Well, we think it does at least. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So that's how it came about. And uh, you know, we we just were like, we we still sort of pinching ourselves to this day. We like that it's like thirty weeks. We we kind of like we send each other a ridiculous amount of audio messages every single day, and <laughs> <laughs> we just can't believe that it's like been thirty. And and we already have almost up to like number 36 recorded and number 42 booked in. So uh, yeah. it, it's really wow. cool. And we're starting to get some really great traction now. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about where it's going, which is cool. That's fantastic. Well, I so enjoyed listening to Diane McGrath's oh, podcast. Isn't she cool. special human? She's oh, awesome. Favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we want to yeah. get into that. We'll, like, ask, we'll probably ask things. you in the yeah. chat, like how you guys know each other and stuff like that as well. For sure. Yeah. She, I have to show you because you're, you're in two different continents, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'll have to show you the view from my office so you can. Oh, um, wow. Oh, my. Can you, see it? Can you see it? Yeah. Can you see the mountains? Awesome. Can you see the city? Those are the trails oh. I run on. And oh. the oh, bike trails awesome. done by on. And Jeez. Oh, yeah, wow. so I, don't, I don't know if you can actually tell. I'm trying to see how much you can actually. Yeah, no, you can, can see, see quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it looks awesome. What a view. Yeah, so pretty spectacular, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Tara, there's something special about having a little bit of elevation, isn't there? Like just it yeah. gives you this special feeling of just openness and freeness yeah wow what a view and just the access i can bomb down the back hill and i just can hit about 100 different trails oh, from that my is house so cool. and yet downtown is just a few miles away so i can uh, be downtown about five minutes which wow. is nice. what a combo yeah what a, and the kids yeah. i suppose the kids must love it as well they can just run around and go crazy yeah it's been really fantastic i mean i just got here a week ago but um yeah they my son's been mountain biking each day and um yeah it's it's really yeah. fantastic oh, um there's so a cool. huge park just over one of the hills in front of me and so uh sunday my daughter and i hiked down my son biked down with a friend and we <laughs> had a I bought him a snow cone and then we <laughs> hiked back and so yeah it's just a really um the access to the outdoors is really fantastic here and that's for me it's sort of a big part of um how I keep myself whole is just spending enough nice. time outside so yeah. yeah I think hearing stories like yours inspires people to also want to do more themselves you know they're like, wow, if you know, if you can do so much, then then I can maybe do something little. And it's all those little things that contribute in the end. Yeah, all, all of us, you know, have an opportunity, I think, and a choice where we just every day make a little step. That's all, you yeah. know? Yeah. And uh, I think we're overwhelmed when we think of big steps, but sometimes it's just one little step each day, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! <laughs> <laughs>
What's up, Gareth? How's it going, my boy? Great, guys. How's it going, my man? How are you, buddy? <laughs> yeah. I'm flipping awesome, my man. How about you? Yeah, very good. Thank you, bud. Very good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> good weekend. Now, good. back in the swing of things. And yourself, bud? Yeah, awesome. My partner uh, did a 21K run yesterday. And uh, I was the token support crew, <laughs> which was... <laughs> I realized I need to get I need to get my ass into gear and uh, and uh, get fit and have a run. It would be good. It's such a good social event, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I used to love uh, going to like running events and stuff and just checking all people like, you know, getting in the sort of spirit of it and like this is like a little bit of competitiveness, a lot of camaraderie, and it's just yeah. like good vibes around generally. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it was good weather as well. It's like not super hot here, so it was just perfect for a good run and. Yeah, just a good day out. So it's yeah. always it's always fun. Yeah, that's cool, man. Hey, but what is, what do you mean partner? Like, what's this partner word? You've been in Australia. Oh uh, yeah, Australia too <laughs> yeah. long already. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting getting too used to it. Hey, eh? just uh, <laughs> the partner word. <laughs> My fiance. Oh, <laughs> that's good stuff. <laughs> oh, classic. Yeah, that's the real word. Don't beat around the bush. You know. The, yeah, yeah, yeah part, exactly. <laughs> howdy, partner. <laughs> and you your your uh your partner just got yeah. back from overseas didn't she <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah my partner <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yeah no marissa she got back uh from florida she was there for like 10 days visiting her best friend which uh you know it's so cool like really cool to i don't know just go and see your buddies and have some friend time you know what i mean um so yeah, yeah. she got back yesterday it was obviously great to see her and yeah, now we're just back in the swing of things with work and the week ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, awesome. Yeah, so so we were talking a little bit um, before this um, chat, obviously, and you know we've received some really awesome feedback um, recently from quite a lot of our listeners, actually. And one of the ones, which was a, a bit of a recurring theme, was actually about the introduction to the podcast and how it's important to probably frame it uh, for our listeners uh, in terms of, you know, who the person is, maybe a little bit about what we talk about, and then, you know, what makes them ridiculously human. And, you know, one thing off the back of that with that we kind of are very conscious of is that as our listeners, you know, we, we really don't want to kind of, you know, waste your time. And we understand that time is of the essence. So, you know, by maybe pre-framing it a little, you can then make the decision yourself. Yeah, cool. I, I want to listen to this or, you know, maybe there's another podcast I want to listen to instead and I'll go listen to that because it sounds like more like just what you want, you know. So, so yeah, so we're going to kind of make these changes and, um, and yeah, I think it's important. Hey, Craig? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, everyone has got only X amount of time in a day and it feels for a lot of people that there's just less and less time. So, we really want to try and, as Gareth said, pre-frame it a little bit better and, uh, yeah, just make it fun intro. Like Gareth and I really enjoy doing this and we really, really love reflect, reflecting on the chats that we've had. Um, and at the same time, it's just good for you guys to just hear what it's going to be all about. And you can definitely make an educated decision based on what uh, our intro is, is going to be. So, uh, in keeping with that theme, uh, this week's chat was with a really, really amazing lady, Tara Russell. We actually got introduced uh, to Tara by one of our previous guests, Diane McGrath, uh, one of our personal favorite interviews. It was just such a great chat with Diane. And any recommendation with her, uh, from her is obviously one we'll, we're going to eagerly follow up, and which we did. And uh, Tara Russell is indeed an amazing lady, and she's uh, really worked in a massive, uh, well, with massive corporates in the past, uh, and she's got a really big heart, and uh, it was a, a really diverse chat. We went really deep and uh, and really wide on a, on a lot of subjects, um, and we really saw how uh, of a bigger, of what of a big heart that she actually does have, hey, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, you know, I guess just a little bit about Tara. She she's this extremely successful um entrepreneur and um she's she's basically run 
uh, or she's she's run a few organizations and and we talk about all of these in the in the chat and um but she started off like you said craig uh, early days uh, with general motors mm. uh, when she moved to china and uh she she was based in shanghai like in the early early years wasn't she like in the 19 yeah 90, late 90s and yeah. um you know that was that was sounds like it was a real mm. sort of turning point for her in her life when she became aware of you know the sort of spectrum of you know wealth compared to uh, people that were very very poor you know and she was she got first-hand experience of that uh specifically in that on that trip hey craig yeah for sure and you know seeing that this the, the disparity between or the, the the big differences in uh in wealth really spurred her on to start thinking differently uh about business and corporates and non-profits and one of the big things that she came up with is she had been struggling the whole time with kind of wondering if she's able or is there always this big dichotomy between a corporate world and a nonprofit and she kind of wanted to figure out how to bridge the gap and in China when she lived there in, in the early days she those seeds were being sowed in how to figure out how to do that and uh, yeah she's like uh, then actually th from off the back of that uh, have has later on um uh, started up or been the head of a start of a number of startups actually uh one of them uh, was where he started in uh thailand where she also lived hey Gareth. yeah absolutely um you know one thing for for tara is that she was abused herself as a youngster and i think that's maybe where some of the work she does stems from like always wanting to generally help people that have suffered in some sort of way, you know, and in Thailand, in Bangkok, this was uh, helping women that were in the sex industry, basically uh, build skills to go and do something else. And uh, yeah, and then like, off, you know, that, that I don't know, I can't remember how many years that that lasted for. Um, but she did return to America where the, she then started um, her own organization and that was the same sort of thing although it was helping people from all different backgrounds you know and mostly refugees uh, where she's from in um, Boise Idaho and that was through like a, a food business basically you know teaching them skills on like how to make food and how to produce food and um, work in a kitchen basically and then you know her next her next one after that is like she's now doing these like i said these experiential community based trips uh from or off the back of like a ship cruise pretty much so mm. she, they have their own liner and it's just uh it's amazing what this woman does like it, it, everything she does is done with uh good intentions and from the right place and you know, Craig, like what what for you really resonated and and makes um, Tara ridiculously human? Well, kind of exactly what you mentioned there. One of the uh, the biggest themes was a theme of empowerment rather than just uh, giving and giving handouts. Uh, she really wants to help these refugees, for example, uh, create great lives for themselves and that they're able to integrate and at the same time from day one actually make some money for their families. Because at the end of the day, it's easy to just, you know, give a handout, but um, to actually f like teach someone skills and help them integrate into society and being a contributor to their communities uh, is super commendable. And uh, that, that was like a massive theme for both of us, hey Gareth? Massive, bud. And it's a, it's a really, really cool chat. And then, you know, like I really enjoyed the sort of end part of it where she talks about um, her ship uh, liner and, and company Fathom. They were one of the first mm. ones to go into Havana, Cuba um, from America. And the story there is really, really heartwarming. Um, so, mm. you know, I think now is a good time for us to hear 
uh, what it's like for Tara Russell to be ridiculously human. Nice. All right. So we have Tara Russell here with us today, all the way from Boys, Idaho. How's it going? It's going nicely. How about for you guys? You having a good day? Great day. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's going well. I actually um, just got back from Istanbul about an, two hours ago. So um, I'm a little bit tired. I got to admit, like I, I was up at 1 a.m. London time and my I don't know why, but I just went ding and i was awake and then since then i've basically been going so but it, it feels nice to be back at home you know what i mean even though it was a short trip like uh of six days it feels good to be back at home that's fantastic jet lag can be brutal yeah it can be. yeah luckily the time zone is not too bad like it's only it's only a couple of hours but uh, i think it's just just been awake for, since 1 a.m <laughs> we'll take it stall probably a little bit later on <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And uh, how's your day been so far? What have you been up to? Uh, it's been a fantastic day. The weather um, is really exceptional right now. We're sort of in the peak of spring, so lots of color. We get all kinds of wildflowers in the hills where I live. And I've been out for a nice uh, run on the trails next to the stream. And, yeah, I had a productive morning. And um, it's, it's been a great day so far. Oh, that sounds really nice. A, you, a few moments ago, just before we got onto the call, uh, Tara showed us her view from her office. And uh, yeah, maybe you want to tell us about where you are and, and yeah, the view and what you do <laughs> there in terms of having a run and getting in your bikes. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I live, work and play out of a place called Boise, Idaho. It's in... Um, sort of the Pacific Northwest in the United States, but a bit east um, and a little bit sunnier and drier. So Boise is what we call high mountain desert. And so we don't get a lot of precipitation um, throughout the year, but we do have four seasons um, and we do get some rain and, and bits of snow in the hills too. Um, lots of snow in the surrounding mountains. So I actually just recently relocated about a week or two and I've moved um, to a part of town called the North End and it just has really spectacular access to the foothills, um, access to running and biking and hiking trails and the view is pretty breathtaking so I can kind of stare across out my office window at the Owyhee Mountains and also stare right at downtown and kind of watch airplanes take off from the airport. Um, yeah. But I find that I'm really affected by light and I'm also really um, affected by just perspective and view. And so I really made a choice to um, to be somewhere that felt very uplifting every day. Mm -hmm. So um, the whole back of the home looks out um, and has this just remarkable view and just, um, yeah, I kind of just put puts things in perspective yeah for sure oh, that sounds awesome yeah. when you when you showed us uh you know where you are craig i don't know what you thought but like craig and i we 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 can't wait to kind of one day live together right like on a piece of land literally <laughs> like yeah. the one when you showed me that i was like oh my gosh this is what craig and i have that's been it. talking about <laughs> i was like that's our future yeah. view it just looks so awesome um, well, you would like it here. It's actually um, one of, if not the fastest growing areas in the whole country. Okay. Um, Idaho, historically, is a state that most people couldn't point to on a map, probably, <laughs> in the United States. Um, you know, if you think about West Coast cities, most people think of uh, Seattle or Portland or San Francisco or L.A. Boise sits just to the east and um kind of butts up adjacently to both Washington and to Oregon. Mm. But it's kind of the um, less familiar state uh, out here. And the whole population of the state is only about 2 million people. So oh, wow. um, the city of Boise is uh, the largest city and the capital city. But we probably have total in the surrounding area about half a million. And so it's a very livable city. And that's literally kind that's of nice. the tag line of the city is to be the most livable city uh yes. in the country and so um just based on the little bit that i know about you both you probably really love it uh people here yeah. very active um lots of runners and bikers lots of skiers and hikers a lot of uh river sports a lot of fly fishing i mean really for almost any outside activity 
Idaho and Boise especially is a really great place to be. Um, and, you know, for me, working full time, having kids, um, accessibility to trails is a really uh, high priority because I don't want to get my car go um, be outside. I want to be able to do it kind of right from the backyard. So you can pick any number of locations around this community and still have access right out your door, which is pretty fantastic. Wow. Isn't it amazing how much time one can save from not having to get changed, go to the gym, hit yeah. the gym, have, sh- you know, like I must say, I'm very happy myself. I haven't been inside of a gym for probably about a year. Um, hmm. just because, just cause it takes so much time, you know, like you can do, um, if you ha- live in a place where it's kind of outdoorsy, it's so convenient, isn't it? It's so nice. And you just, yeah, I don't know. It does you end up not wasting any time by just straight onto the trail and off you go, you know? And, okay. uh, so Boise is pronounced. We weren't sure we were, I called it boys and I was like, and Boise is the actual way to say it. <laughs> so I have to tell you, um, I'm not from Boise and there are two ways that people often pronounce it. One is they'll say like Boise with a Z. Um, but the proper pronunciation is actually Boise, like yeah. almost like boy with the letter C. Yeah. Um, so people around town kind of joke, you know, I've lived here for about 10 years and I still make <laughs> a mistake, but, um, you know, if you, if you say boy Z, then they kind of know you're not. From <laughs> here. Um, whereas if you say boy C, which is very small nuance, um, that's how people supposedly, uh. you know, one of the ways they know you're from around here but so if um, you say boys like i did then they to- they yeah, certainly like, know you're not from there <laughs> yeah they they assume it's probably um somewhere you haven't spent a whole lot of time yeah yet. Yeah. yeah they like but you know but you were yeah. saying like commuting to the gym i've become it sounds really weird to say but i've become really lazy in my exercise like i want it to be really accessible and i don't want to spend any time commuting i'm terrible at going to the gym i just purely work out outside you know year round so so. yeah this is so much is this i don't know you just get like so much extra from training outside as opposed to hitting the gym um but i mean i i can't say anything because i I literally used to i hit the gym for 20 years until a year ago so um you know it's provided me with a lot of um a lot of happiness and stuff like that Mm -hmm. but like these days yeah there's just there's this this ex, these extra endorphins from from being outside that's for sure and I yeah I definitely feel like I notice I'm more happier when I'm outside too there's something about it and you and you mentioned something about light earlier on is that you 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 you're happier when it's lighter or you're sensitive to light what was the thinking yeah about? well throughout probably the last twenty years I've lived in a variety of different places and um, one of the things that I notice is I'm Um, heavily influenced in terms of how I feel by the volume or just amount of light that the space gets. So I have a really dear friend who's uh, just fantastic with like home and interior space and just kind of has a gift with space. And she always talked about how much it changes how you feel. And I don't think until the last uh, home I was living in, I was so aware. um, The last home I was living in was much brighter than the prior location and the windows were just kind of everywhere. And even if it wasn't a sunny day, I noticed how, um, kind of much light and just how uplifting it felt. So I really made a very conscious choice in terms of, um, you know, finding this location where I live now, I made a conscious choice to kind of buy the location and buy the light in the space. Um, Mm -hmm as something that was a benefit, you know, affecting me sort of more, I valued it more than, than other criteria. So, you know, they, I think if you, and I, I don't know about the data myself, but I know that people living in different parts of the world obviously have very different amounts of light. Mm. And some good friends of ours, uh, lived, um, overseas and really far North and they bought, they actually purchased lights that kind of like they call them happy lights, but they were getting such little daylight um, that they they kind of consciously put themselves in front of these happy lights to get kind of what their their bodies and spirits needed to feel that light. So, yeah, I know I notice I'm really affected by um, 
just the light and the perspective. And it's kind of like you were talking about the gym versus outside. I totally admire people that go to the gym. I, I just think maybe I'm not that disciplined, but <laughs> when I go outside for me, it's sort of like a, like a spiritual experience as well as like a physical experience. You know, I just noticed that being in nature, being in a place that is kind of awe inspiring and watching, you know, the birds and the, just the plants and the water, mm. like, um, it, for me is something it's hard to like, it's hard to get an equivalent experience inside like that, you know? Yeah, definitely. For sure. hundred percent. Yeah. It's such a, a special way of connecting with yourself, being in nature again and, and just feeling, um, reconnected to the, like a bigger picture, you know, like you just, you know, you're not in this little box all day long and, you know, it's not what it's all about, you know, so uh, we totally agree with that. We, we, we often discuss this kind of thing. And, um, but obviously, you know, Gareth, like you said, like you, you, you used to, um, bodybuild and I guess when the, when the weather's really horrible, there's a, it's quite nice to be able to go hit the gym as well. So yeah. there is a, there is certainly a, a place for it, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. But, sure. yeah. So, so. Tara, um, we have a mutual friend in common. Oh, and, really? And uh, her name is Diane McGraw. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and uh, she's Thank just a so wonderful, wonderful uh, human being. Uh, she's super knowledgeable on, obviously, all things health and experimental things that she does with herself and super smart woman. Uh, so, and she put us in contact, uh, with you, Tara, we're very grateful for that. And, but what is the, the background? How do you guys know each other? Yeah, well, Diane McGrath is, is truly one of my favorite humans, um, on the planet. And we were, um, really fortunate to have gotten to know each other about a year and a half ago now. Actually, oddly, we were probably two, um, kind of of the, maybe of the misfits at a gathering, a travel industry gathering in Sydney, Australia. So we were both invited as speakers um, to an annual gathering called the World's Leading Cruise Line. And it was down under in Sydney and several of our brands um, and several of the travel agents across Australia that worked with these brands were there. And so it was a gathering of, um, few hundred, 500, 600, I don't know, people. And um, Diane and I were both invited to speak. And so, you know, I would, personally am new to the cruise industry just over the last handful of years. Um, and Diane was obviously not a cruise industry person. And <laughs> so we, um, we really hit it off. We were both there, uh, you know, kind of preparing, I guess, to talk or to speak. Um, and sitting just in a room all together and we just started to kind of strike up a chat and, um, you know, she immediately struck me as someone who was just so, um, purpose oriented and intentioned. And, you know, I really believe in living, um, a very kind of intention purpose driven life. And so I feel like we had a lot, um, to talk about pretty quickly. We ended up, you know, having dinner, um, one evening and kind of hanging out. And I think we all worked out together one morning. And um, after spending a handful of days together, a few days at this conference, and both of us sharing, um, I was sharing uh, about Fathom and also kind of about my own personal journey. And she was sharing about her own journey and, and the Mars One experience. Uh, we just made a commitment to stay in touch and to try to have sort of a monthly Skype, uh, hang out and to really kind of, um, share, uh, what we were learning and what we were, um, kind of doing. And, you know, I'll tell you that our conversations and our, um, connection has been so much fun. We've hung out in uh, New York city. Mm -hmm. Um, she came, uh, with us on one of the fathom experiences as kind of a guest, um, speaker and workshop leader, um, everyone she meets, uh, she, you know, impacts deeply and mm. tremendously inspiring, you know, human. And so, you know, we never named a godmother for Fathom. We, in our season, first season, we repurposed a small ship and offered seven day experiences. Um, but the ship had already had a godmother that was kind of a, you know, 
kind of named with that ship when the ship was kind of built and introduced to the fleet. And so we didn't uh, have the opportunity to do that. And yet I kind of joked that had we had the opportunity, someone like Diane, Diane's who I would have um, <laughs> asked to be our she is so authentically living what I believe is a, you know, purpose-driven, intention life um, that is really focused on kind of optimizing, you know, every aspect mm. um, of her world. And she's generous in terms of, you know, sharing what she learns. And I think, uh, you know, we're all kind of here on this journey together. And so, um, yeah, she's someone I, I admire a lot and have really had a lot of fun with. Uh, as we've gotten to know each other over the last year and a half. Yeah, that's that's, that's really nice that's really cool. She's like, it's amazing. Like since uh, since we chatted to Diane, I felt like this real sort of connection with her. And you know, we, we've you know with Craig as well. We've had like a lot of just chats with her on Instagram and and enjoyed the things she's doing. And actually, another thing you guys have in common is actually uh, Diane also has. Um, she's very sensitive to light. I remember her saying in our podcast. Um, oh. So. There's another thing for you guys, um, <laughs> <laughs> but but so yeah, so like let's if we can like maybe just sort of uh, take your your story back a little bit. We you know w there's so much we want to talk to you about. You know, like you've just sort of um, told us about Fathom now, but you know, like uh, if we if we can just take it back, I guess to the to the start a little bit and and understand um, you know who Tara Russell is, where she comes from. Um, you know, you mentioned that you, you're not actually from um, Idaho. You were born, um, I think, did you say, like in Pennsylvania? Um, so, yeah, if you can just take us back and, and uh, just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your parents and your family. Yeah. Well, um, I like to say that I feel like I, I won the birth lottery, right? I grew up <laughs> in a fairly... Um, typical kind of suburban Midwestern home. I was born in Pennsylvania um, to, you know, two wonderful parents who, you know, today, 42, almost 43 years later, still love each other and are still married and still love me most of the time, I feel like. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we didn't have much growing up. Um, my parents got married very young, but we always had a roof over our head. We always had enough to eat. Um, we we never lacked for anything or really wanted for anything. And so, you know, having traveled the world a good bit and um, having, in, you know, been in the space of social impact um, over the last 20 years, you know, I'm so aware how well off we are when we have the basics. So um, we moved a lot as a kid. Mm -hmm. My dad was in the kind of um, paper products industry. So he was in the corrugated box industry. And every few years we would move as he would go into kind of leadership with a new company often. And, you know, looking back in hindsight, I think that moving a lot really helped me to adapt fairly easily to new places. I also think it really helped me to kind of learn to love something about every place and every person. And so um, you know, I've often looked at the world just very opportunistically. And I think, you know, moving a lot as a kid, um, it made our family really close. And it also made me um, kind of cu more curious and more eager to experience new places. Um, I really had very little travel and international experience um, as a young person. We, I think I went on my first airplane when I was about 10. And most of our trips if we went on holiday, we're driving vacations that we could all fit in the station wagon and um, drive to either family and relatives' houses or, um, you know, somewhere special within driving reach. And so, you know, it really probably wasn't until I went to college that I started um, to be exposed and, and to begin traveling a little bit more internationally. I did a lot of volunteer work. Um, so I went to school kind of Growing up, I played a lot of sports, um, was kind of a, a, a nerd at school, and I had okay. this um, idea of being in medicine and really thought I would go into the medical field. And so for whatever reason, I decided that uh, studying engineering as an undergraduate um, would be a good foundation to get into medical school. And a lot of 
the medical school acceptance rates were really strong for people who start in engineering. And so I started in engineering, actually chose to go to school at a place called Georgia Tech. Um, it's in Atlanta, Georgia, and it is a uh, heavily based engineering and kind of science school. It's not a you know, huge university that has all kinds of options. So it has kind of engineering um, and a few other things, and, and that's about it. I studied mechanical engineering, and actually um, my freshman year, I started working with General Motors at a place called Saturn Corporation. And so it was, at the time, um, you know, General Motors was one of, if not the largest company on the planet, I think. Um, Saturn was kind of their newer brand and kind of a, a new kid on the block. It was um, focused on lean manufacturing. And so I was hired to work at Saturn. And as a you know freshman in college, um, I was part of a cool program that you sort of, you went to school a quarter, but then you went to work a quarter, you went to school a quarter, you went to work a quarter. So, you know, by the time I had, I graduated from college, I had, you know, worked a, like three and a half years um, in a, in a real job, which was great. So, I was exposed to, you know, product development and to manufacturing as a young college student. And I really was more intrigued and more interested in like the product business than I expected to be. I really, I loved what I was doing. I was constantly being thrown new challenges. And as a person who likes to learn, there was just endless volume of learning opportunity in an automobile manufacturing plant. So mm -hmm. I worked first as like a process engineer in the body shop um, and learned about fixing robots and weld guns and keeping conveyor belts in motion. And then I worked in uh, the paint department and, and I worked in polymers and plastics. So it really, um, General Motors and Saturn specifically were very generous to me. I had uh, several people kind of put their hand on me and, and really spend time and mentor me. Um, and I was then invited to go to Shanghai in the year 1999. Um, I was offered an opportunity to be part of the, the Shanghai General Motors um, new build plant. So GM decided about 1997 or eight that they were going to manufacture cars uh, for China in China for the first time. So Typically, um, you know, any cars that were sold in China came from somewhere else um, if they were North American, um, you know, or other um, models of cars. And so it was a big moment. Um, you know, it was 1999 when I was invited to come. And as a very naive young college person, I thought, yeah, sure. You know, they as soon as they asked, I said yes, um, knowing you know, little to nothing really about China and about Shanghai at the time. Uh -huh. But I had this kind of dreamy idea of living and working overseas. And so I actually had to leave college for a while. I took a full-time job with GM, went to work in Shanghai during the year of 1999. And I'm so grateful that I did. It was um, probably one of the most transformative and impactful uh, years of my life. Um, having been from you know, a pretty standard family um, upbringing, you know, I'd never really lived um, so close to abject poverty. And I had never um, really seen and known families day to day that, you know, lived so differently than I did or grew up so differently. And so I was, um, I was deeply impacted that year. I also worked with individuals and, and people from all over the world, mostly not Americans. So I really, that year um, changed my life. It helped me understand I really wanted to be in the space of global business or, you know, doing something globally in my work. Um, and I really, that year was wrestling with how to best impact the world. And I kind of saw two different paths. I thought either I should go be a good human and I should live in the space of international development or missions or you know, some kind of volunteering like um, realm, or I, I thought I could go be a business person. And I, I didn't really see those worlds as um, intersecting or overlapping. I saw them as two very different paths. And one kind of felt like the good path and one kind of felt like the not so good path. And 
it was that year that I really uh, realized um, I loved business. I've always loved business, um, but I really wanted to try to create businesses that were um, transforming people's lives. And so I wanted to take my passion for business and, and product development, product creation, and really explore do what now everybody speaks about, which is social enterprise. But at the time, that term was just not that familiar to me. Mm. Take, take us back to that moment when you realized, like what you said earlier, that that people live in abject poverty. And what was the moment when you it really sort of struck you? Hmm. Well, you know, I think um, my nature is I love to connect with people and I, I love to really get to know um, people in terms of just friendships and, and developing relationships. And so, you know, I got to know all of my Chinese coworkers um, and there was a small group of kind of the young professionals uh, that kind of took me under their wing. And I was fortunate to get to, you know, sometimes on the weekends we would go out together. Um, they would have me over to their home to eat or to visit their homes. And, you know, going into the homes of, um, you know, Chinese young professionals who had master's degrees, sometimes PhD degrees, and they were still living with their parents in a really small um, apartment or kind of condo type setup. And this was really what I considered the well-to-do, um, you know, up-and-coming potential leaders. Um, mm. And so that, that was kind of one side of the coin. And really, these individuals um, now are what we've heard of as the rising middle class in China. I mean, now they, they own homes and they own cars and they've really um, prospered over the last 20 years. Mm. But then on the other side, I was living in a small apartment building and sort of a service department that General Motors had either rented in entirety or, or bought for us to live in. And right outside the door um, was just a pig field and a small like rice paddy fields and um, really, really small kind of stone dwellings and homes. And it, I, I'd never seen or been anywhere near really um, wow. something like that. And I'd never seen uh, just day to day that level of poverty. Um, and, you know, it, it really affected me. Um, some of the coworkers that I was working with um, came in from really, really far parts of Western China. And these were the, the construction workers who were doing further work on the facility. And they, um, they were so, so thin. And I'm not a big person. I'm fairly small person in the States, but I was sort of a big person in uh, China. And wow. I was struck by how just emaciated, really, many of these men who were there working on, you know, they had taken a train for a full day, um, you know, to, to work these day labor jobs. Jeez. And so, you know, getting to know them, learning about their families. Um, you know, I really enjoyed the friendships I had and they were, it felt like at very different extremes. Um, and I so enjoyed in whatever way I could trying to engage or expose, um, any number of people to, you know, the things that I was fortunate uh, to have. So, um, you know, when I would go home, I might bring back books or different things um, for their kids or, you know, different activities. Um, and I, I just really um, was so energized by the connection I had with all these different groups of people. Um, and they were how I learned the culture. I mm -hmm. ended up learning how to speak Mandarin, not perfectly and um, surely not fluently, but I spoke Mandarin while I was there. And I really learned from all my Chinese friends and just from fumbling through it um, myself in the factory. And uh, one of the, the dearest connections I made was with um, one of the Chinese drivers. And in China at the time, it was very customary for anyone who was like an expat like me, someone not from the local community, um, often had drivers that would drive 
them around. And while I didn't have a driver specifically assigned to me, I did get to know the drivers pretty well. And one of them helped me a lot. And he was always trying to introduce me to new things. And I'll never forget him having me over for Chinese New Year one year. And he had me to his home. And it was two rooms, um, all kind of concrete, um, probably 10 of them living there. And, you know, one room is sort of the kitchen and one room is sort of, you know, the living and eating area and sleeping area. And mm. he cooked probably for a week for just me. I went over wow. and I'll never forget the table set up and how wow. there were dozens of dishes and all of it he had, you know, he had made for me just to, uh, you know, just to give me a true Chinese New Year authentic oh, wow. experience and so um it was a humbling year where you know i was definitely a fish out of water most of the time and yet um you know the chinese people were very generous and kind to me i felt that trying to learn the language helped you know they were um mm. i think they appreciated that i was trying and they all um would do what they could to help. So mm. yeah. China was like my first love, probably. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. I've, I've always uh, thought that um, people in Asia are just so kind and so nice. There's just something beautiful about them as people. Like every time you go there, they're just like, they're genuinely interested in you, you know, and they, they want to show you a, great, a good time. Um, and there's just something so sincere about that. Um, and it's, I, it's in all of Asia, like I find in places I've visited, it, it seems to be like a common trait, something which we can truly learn from, I think, you know, in, in the West. So just a quick one, like, first of all, um, did, did, did he cook you any like chicken feet or any sort of local delicacies? <laughs> oh, there was definitely some weird stuff. Yeah. yeah. At one point, the funniest story was actually at one point he brought out a dish and I was trying to ask him in Chinese what it was and he was struggling <laughs> and he asked his wife and his kids and they were kind of chatting back and forth and struggling and he finally said, well, this was the what they called an IE, which is sort of like a house helper. This was the house helper's dog oh, oh wow didn't have space for the house helper's dog in the oh, house wow and because it was two room <laughs> tiny place and i my eyes i'm sure were like as big as oh my uh, god you know, golf balls and i just <laughs> passed on that one uh but it was um everything you can imagine was on the table wow. yeah and um yeah, they, nothing, yeah, nothing goes nothing. speed, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, what was Shanghai like in 1999? Because, I mean, now it's this thriving metropolis. I mean, back then, I, I, I don't think it was like that, was it? Or was it just beginning? You know, it was a, a radically different city at the time that I moved there. So in 1999, there was... Um, you know, this explosion happening in terms of a lot of global development and global business kind of wanting to come to China. I th General Motors was one of the first, if not the first, first joint venture in China. So, it, um, you know, China essentially, you know, offered a structure, a joint venture structure that would allow a foreign company to come and, and do business in China. And so at the time, um, Shanghai was almost like two different cities. Um, on one side, you had what's called Puxi. And Puxi is um, the city, the old city. It's uh, the city just west of the Bund and the river. And it's kind of like the Manhattan of Shanghai. I mean, it had been in existence um, forever. And there were all kinds of different parts of the community. You know, you had the sort of um, the European district and you had you know, it was where all the skyscrapers were. Now, at the same time when I was there, uh, the eastern side of the river called Pudong was just beginning to really be built. And so there were a handful of skyscrapers in Pudong and not much um, developed yet. And so General Motors um, manufacturing plant was over in Pudong in kind of the 
um, more rural area at the time. And we were one of the first factories kind of out in this manufacturing district that was kind of exploding. And so I literally felt like I saw the eastern side of the city, like the second Manhattan. I saw it built like the year I was there. Um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they were building um, more of, I think at the time, World's Cranes, large cranes to develop, you know, skyscrapers and tall buildings were there. Um, It was so dynamic just in terms of, I guess, what was changing and how the city was growing. So, you know, I think when I was there, the population was probably, I'm, I don't know exactly, but maybe between like 12 and 15 million people, I believe. And now I think the population is like 24, 26 million people. So, wow. you know, to give you a sense Jeez. in less than 20 years, um, the city has almost doubled, it feels like. And, you know, what's happening in Shanghai um, is not probably totally unique to um, Shanghai and to China, but, you know, you have all this urban migration. So you have people coming into the city from all kinds of rural parts of the country. And, you know, a lot of the good jobs are in Shanghai and a lot of the, you know, foreign companies and foreign investment has happened in Shanghai and in these larger cities. And so um, it was such a fascinating place to live. I I thought of it as a very kind of strangely enchanting, um, you know, place because you were just seeing new things all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. We worked like crazy. And so we weren't out and about on the town a ton. But um, I remember when we did go out, uh, being at some of the international um, kind of hangouts or locations, and just noticing just, you know, tons and tons of new groups of international people, you know, that were arriving. And so, you know, there was a, a community of foreign workers like myself that was maybe at the time like one or two million people I mean it was um it was growing pretty quickly maybe it was about a million maybe it's two now or something but you know there were growing pockets of Canadians and growing pockets of Australians and Europeans and so it was it was so fun because everything about the experience was very multicultural yeah Shanghai is very cosmopolitan city wow and and did was it very apparent at the time uh, the sort of censorship that that sort of had been happening in China and that kind of thing? You know, a lot of other countries in the world have got this sort of a big influence from the states, and I would imagine it would have been quite different there, especially at that time. Yeah, you know, it was really interesting time to be there. Um, I remember reading some of the local newspapers, the, you know, like the, maybe the South China Daily News or um, the China Post. I can't remember exactly what they were called, but I remember reading the local newspapers and being sort of struck by the headlines and, you know, kind of um, confused because they seem different than the headlines back home. And it, for me as a young person that was very naive, it, um, it was the first I realized how, like how media has such a strong opinion, um, Mm. and how much that those opinions influence the narrative and the stories that are being told. And so Mm. for me, it was kind of a, a really stark moment of, wow, well, this seems odd, but maybe I should question my own, um, you know, news sources, maybe I should be a bit more, yeah. you know, thoughtful about, um, the perspectives that I curate. And I remember being struck by how normal everything to my colleagues, my really well-educated Chinese colleagues with masters and PhDs, you know, they thought nothing of, um, they didn't feel limited. They didn't feel, um, censored or, um, it, it was really interesting. Um, mm-hmm. they were so proud of their country and so proud to be Chinese. And, you know, so I, I, I also think as Americans, at least, um, we, <laughs> we tend to have a very like egocentric view of the world. Um, and we, <laughs> you know, think everyone should speak English and we think America is, you know, the best country in the world. And, 
America is an amazing place to live and we live with freedoms and um, opportunities galore. And I'm so proud to be an American, but I also, um, I love to learn from other cultures. And I think, um, you know, there's no one country on the planet where everything is ideal. And, you know, I think if you could cobble together the best place in the world to live, it would take aspects of probably lots of different cultures and it would combine them. And so what always struck me is I would come home from China and people would sort of make assumptions or judgments. And, you know, when you live in a different place, um, it changes the way, you know, you see everything and it helps you realize the pros and cons and opportunities and challenges, um, you know, in, in many different cultures. So, um, it, it really, my experience in Shanghai opened my kind of eyes and my heart to the world. I feel like, um, it, it probably also made me a more, um, discerning, you know, young adult, just um, having had the experiences I had. Yeah. What, what was sure. the, what was the news like the other way? So like, what, do, what was the Chinese saying about the Americans? Was it? Well, you know, it's interesting. I was there during a time when one of the U S embassies was bombed. And, um, of course my grandparents and my family were all nervous because, you know, at the time we weren't so interconnected as we are now today. We mm-hmm. could send a text message to our loved ones in Shanghai and, you know, hear from them immediately. Right. But I was there at a time where, you know, you, I made one phone call every few weeks. It cost me a lot of money. It, It wasn't, you know, a frequent communication time and we just weren't so connected as we are today. Um, but I remember, my grandmother at the time, um, speaking with her briefly and she was weeping and she said, Oh, it looks like everyone in Shanghai is protesting and, um, it looks so dangerous and so rough. And, and the truth was, um, of course, uh, the news had zeroed in on one little location where there was, um, (laughs) a small protest, but most of town, we had no idea. And most of town is absolutely fine. And so, it was sort of one of those um, interesting experiences I was living through, you know, recognizing that the story being told or what, what it like looked like in terms of the um, kind of the, the size of the reaction was so disproportionate to the truth. Um, and, you know, it, again, it was just like a really interesting moment that made me perhaps question you know, other things, um, a little bit more seriously, you know, in the future of that. So, um, so that's just kind of one example. It's, it's really, I think it's so important to, to, to have perspective on your own ideals and things like you, you had that experience and hence why travel is often, you know, especially living in another place is, is so good for that. But I, you know, it just makes me think talking about the news stories, like, this situation of fake news that's sort of going around. It's pretty crazy. Hey, like, I don't know. How do you sort of combat uh, and find the truth and uh, of a matter? Uh, I think it's really difficult these days, uh, especially with uh, the, the sort of ease that a, a meme can sort of spread uh, with social media. Uh, and you end up in the sort of echo chamber of your own, ideals and it's almost like we're more connected than ever but but then also less connected because you just kind of find the news that suits you it's kind of crazy well it's it's interesting what you say and and so true i think um we tend to mostly read or consume things that are furthering our own perspectives (laughs) so we like to read books where the person is talking about something that is kind of you know our point of view um or i notice you know we we often do that. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, I just think in the States, at least, it seems people take kind of one extreme or the other. I think there are those very, um, intentioned, curious, knowledgeable readers who make a point to read very diverse things to kind of gather, um, you know, their own opinion. Um, 
And then, you know, most people and most of us, you know, if you're reading something, you read quickly and you, you scan through it and, you know, you may not take in multiple news sources, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, here, and I'm sure it's the same probably for you both, but we're so bombarded by messaging, um, you know, digitally through so many channels. I actually, I find myself often just tuning out and getting a bit callous, yeah. um, <laughs> You know, and, and frankly, the news is not um, um, always telling the really positive, uplifting, inspiring stories. Um, a lot of times the news is kind of bad news around mm. the world. Um, bad news locally, bad news regionally, <laughs> bad news globally. And uh, especially as a parent, um, my heart just wow. cannot, you know, I can't take. I have a hard time, you know, getting rid of images sort of once they they're in my mind. And so I really have a hard time. I never watch the news on television. Mm. Um, I just find it sad and kind of depressing, you know, um, and politically our political situation is so challenging and (laughs) depressing that I think a lot of us have just, um, maybe reduced the volume of news that we're consuming. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I, it's weird because when I think about it, I reckon like, I mean, fake news has been around for ages. You know what I mean? It's just like Mm. the only thing is now it's more, it's more obvious because there is more news and it's easier to, to sort of, I guess, see what, what is fake and what isn't. Cause you know, you can see both sides of the story. So, Mm. um, in a way it's like, it's a mixed bag from, from my point of view, like you can, you can easily see what's fake and what's not, um, Mm. if you go looking for it. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but, but it is still concerning because there's so much more news out there that I guess there's so much more fake stuff as well. Um, yeah. but, uh, you have to kind of be selective when it comes to that, but also, you know, like you said, you have to read both sides of the stories to get a, a good sort of balanced view on things. Um, mm. so Tara, Tara, I was just wondering, like, um, you, you touched on, uh, when you were in Shanghai, you're kind of like at this point in your life where it was almost like a bit of a dilemma, you know, do you carry on with, with your, your corporate gig? Um, or do you start something sort of more uh, community, uh, charity, nonprofit based? And, and something did happen off the back of that. Um, you, you started a business uh, called Nightlight International. Um, and that was, but I, I'm just trying to find out, that was based in Bangkok, was it? So d- had you moved to Bangkok or uh, how had things sort of, tr- um, you know, sort of moved on from when you were in Shanghai? Yeah, so um, so actually when I was living in Shanghai, um, I hadn't finished undergrad school. So after my experience in Shanghai and spending about a year there, I went back to Atlanta, finished um, my mechanical engineering degree, and then uh, started working with Intel um, out in Portland, Oregon, um, and then worked for Nike out in Portland, Oregon, before actually moving overseas to Bangkok. So I did sort of make the kind of like a personal commitment to myself that year. Okay, I really want to do kind of socially minded business, um, something that transforms other people's lives. And I, you know, I, I kind of that year discovered that I, my passion was really helping to equip and empower and enable others. Um, and much of what I was doing in China, even in the manufacturing facility was helping to teach and train and equip the local, um, community with, you know, how to build cars, how to do quality control, how to troubleshoot tools. Um, and so I kind of discovered that kind of passion and what I felt was kind of my purpose here that year. Um, in 2003, actually in 2002, uh, we were offered an opportunity to go to Bangkok. And I, at the time, made a decision to kind of like let that be the year I stepped away from the certainty of big corporate um, structure and kind of security within a big company. And really began what was more for me at the time, a a more entrepreneurial journey. And so my nature is just, I'm a entrepreneur at heart and very much a serial entrepreneur, but um, it wasn't until that year that I'd really like left 
all the comforts of home to do that more fully. And so I was really fortunate in Bangkok when we moved to Bangkok that uh, I worked with and tried to serve and support several different nonprofits and organizations and social enterprise groups um, in Bangkok. And personally, I was very passionate about uh, human trafficking and really, um, you know, issues of like women's exploitation. And, and I wanted to kind of put myself kind of right in the middle of that um, and see what ways I might um, be able to help. And so I served and supported a few different organizations. And there was a small group of us um, who wanted to kind of start something new and to really broaden the employment opportunities for women in the sex industry. And, um, and so I was one of a small group of us. There were five of us that started uh, Nightlight International in Bangkok. And the woman really who I consider the, the primary founder is, you know, still there and still serving to this day. And the organiza organization has grown now, has, you know, different international locations. But, you know, we were really focused on kind of holistic restoration for women who had come um, through the sex trade or had been trafficked. Um, we worked with, you know primarily adults, but there were kids involved too. Um, and, you know, I, my kind of focus was more on the, the job training and the enterprise portion of our work. You know, we were doing really kind of physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, everything support with and for, um, these women. And so I, was really mostly focused on trying to get the enterprise model um, developed, trying to help broaden, you know, the enterprise opportunity so that we could generate revenue to support a lot of the rehabilitation services that we were offering um, to the women. So, so that, like, you know, so many things in my life, but that that time frame really changed my life as well. Um, you know the economic pressures that so many families face in uh, Thailand and other countries really drive them to, um, you know, exploring how to earn revenue and make money um, in, in all kinds of ways. And, you know, I just, I find the older I get and the more experiences I have, <laughs> the less uh, judgment I make on most things. Um, mm. But I think the truth is we often don't really understand an issue. Um, and when you kind of find yourself in the middle of it, you realize how complex it really is. And so there were women who chose to be a part of the industry. But the great majority of women um, that I got to know and that we worked with, um, maybe their family had sold them into um, the trade, uh, maybe they had been encouraged or pressured by their families in very rural areas to come to the city and find work and do whatever it took. Um, you know, and as a mom, if your kids can't eat, I just can't imagine, um, Jeez. how hard it would be, um, you know, to find your way. And so, um, we enjoyed the opportunity to get to know these women and to provide what we considered to be alternative pathways if they chose. And so we had a jewelry uh, making business and that was something that they could leave the bars on a Wednesday and on Thursday they could show up for work with us. And it was sort of simple enough that we could train them quickly and put them into kind of manufacturing right away. Now we also tried as we learned some of these women had a dream of being a nurse or going to cosmetology school. And so we also tried to empower those pathways. Um, but usually they needed immediately first to have a, a way to make money um, the next day. And so again, when you're living in a culture where people make four bucks a day, maybe, um, you know, you just, it, it opens your eyes uh, to so much. And so, my time in Bangkok um, was really formative. I worked with various different organizations and really focused on the enterprise uh, model for those organizations. I worked with another group that was uh, families living in some communities and we um, helped them take their sewing skills because a lot of them had actually worked at shoemaking factories, sewing shoes, 
but then they had children, they wanted to stay at home and do some work from home and have flexible arrangements. So we kind of helped them to make products that were then sold overseas as well. And so it was good exposure. It was a um, crash course in learning everything. Um, mostly things that didn't work, um, but we figured out mm-hmm. some things that did work. And it was really the precursor for me to, um, you know, creating an organization here in the States called Create Common Good, which is similarly focused on job training um, and empowerment, but with a bit of a different lens industry-wise that we work in. That's really amazing. I think it's in Thailand, I guess it's quite confronting in many ways, uh, that sex industry and uh, someone we actually spoke to recently discussed sort of human trafficking and stuff and what a massive issue it is. And I, I personally hadn't realized like sort of how prolific it is. So I guess you were exposed to that uh, at the time. But how did you sort of find the people that you started this uh, enterprise with and how, how did that sort of come about? Yeah, well, it was actually uh, four of us Americans and one a Thai woman. Um, we were all kind of volunteering or working with another organization that was focused on human trafficking and the sex trade uh, in Bangkok. And Bangkok is such a huge place that um, part of what we wanted to see was different parts of the city have kind of physical locations and operations where women could um, receive support. And so we very purposely um, kind of talked about another part of town that just didn't have the presence of, you know, a support services organization. And we, you know, mm-hmm. consciously chose to go to an area of town called Nana, which was just um it, it was often not thought of as much, but it was as heavily, um, you know, exposed to the same things. And so it, proximity matters a lot in Bangkok because it takes a long time to get between places, depending on where you're at in the city. And so, um, so yeah, so we kind of got to know each other while we were all working with another organization and uh-huh. serving and supporting there. And we all kind of shared the vision of, of taking a different approach Um and of trying to physically be, you know, in a part of town that didn't maybe have something bright for the women. Yeah, yeah. And was there any particular reason that you, you know, you were um, interested in this particular uh, sort of um, like field? I don't know, field field's not the right word, or but like like why why did you want to help a woman that were in um, in the sex trade? Was there any reason for it? You know, it's a really great question. And interestingly enough, um, my heart was always really burdened for women in human trafficking in the sex industry. I have a cousin who similarly um, had a same same kind of burden. And we often talked about that and kind of prayed for women around the world and and just dreamed about the opportunity to somehow get engaged, um, you know, in the arena. Now, interestingly, at the time, I didn't really know that I had been sexually abused as a child. Um, But now in hindsight, knowing kind of my experience, I think I probably always have had a bit of a like protector or um, just a compassionate heart for people who've been in abusive situations or, um, you know, maybe who are taken advantage of and, uh, yeah, so it was something that always burdened my heart. Um, it's a super heavy, it's a super heavy field to work in, um, mm. and it it really did take a toll on my spirit as well. I have a hard time kind of putting things down once they impress upon my heart, and you know it's hard to go home at night and not carry, you know, the stories of these women or children and what was happening, and so. Um, you know, there, while there was much joy for seeing women um, become empowered in new ways, there was also a lot of sadness during that season um, and just uh, heaviness for um, what these women were facing. So, wow. so sorry, like, I mean, you don't have to answer or anything, but did you, are you saying that you, you suffer from abuse yourself as a youngster? 
I did. I was actually abused as a child, yeah, by a friend's brother um, when I was very young. And in it seems that for years I just repressed those memories and kind of kept them far away and hidden. Um, and it wasn't until my daughter was about the age that I was when the abuse happened that the memories really began to come back um, in full clarity. And um, But as I've kind of walked through that journey over the last handful of years, um, it makes me realize now that the, the positive thing about my own experience with abuse was it sort of, it allows me to empathize and truly kind of feel the pain um, others experience in marginalized or, you know, kind of abusive situations. I think I have kind of a super um, feeler nature in that, you know, I, I just have a deep level of empathy for other people you know, going through pain. And I think in some ways I kind of focused a lot of energy on mitigating the pain in other people's lives. And, and at the time really was kind of not facing the pain I had sort of buried, um, from years before. And so, um, you know, I've, you know, throughout my adult years been fortunate to be a part of building several different things. And, um, all of those, organizations in some way really serve a marginalized um, group of people who doesn't really have a voice. And I think, you know, as a kid, I obviously didn't feel like I uh, could talk about it or had, I didn't have a voice. Um, and it was something that was so uh, probably just shameful and felt so dirty that, you know, I, I buried it, you know, deep, deep down. And so, you know, I think that it's a really bizarre and interesting time in our culture because, um, you know, the Me Too movement and people starting to speak up about, um, you know, issues of being, you know, abused or um, mistreated in the workplace or otherwise, um, you know, there's a growing level of consciousness about, you know, what's okay and what's not okay. You know, my sincere hope is that um, that we can really start to talk about uh, child abuse, you know, abuse with children, because I don't know about, about where you are, but it's just not something we, we just don't talk about it a lot here. It's mm. not really like dinner conversation, yeah. you know? Mm. No, of course. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I have a good friend, I'm actually wearing one of his products today, but, um, a good friend who runs an organization here called speaker silence. And this is his little, I don't know if you could see it, but oh, yeah, there we go. his little orange, uh, stitch. Ooh. And, um, he was abused as a child and really his whole life is about getting out of bed to kind of remove the stigma associated with childhood sexual mm -hmm. abuse. And so he built an organization and I um, try to do what I can to support him and the organization because I do think we have to become more comfortable talking about it in order to mm. build uh, better ways of preventing it. You know, I think the statistics are just crazy. But in the States, I think it's about one in three maybe that are abused. Mm. So um, it's happening too much. And, uh, you know, my hope is that there becomes sort of a, a broader consciousness, um, you know, in this next season in terms of how, um, how men treat women, how women treat men, how men treat men, how women treat, you know, I think we just, um, as human beings, <laughs> we owe it to ourselves, um, and to one another to be strong enough to call things out when they're not okay. Um, but also to give kids or others um, safe places or channels or, or, or ways um, to share about what's happening if, uh, if they're going through things that, you know, aren't okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, Tara, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think, unfortunately, there's, as you mentioned, there's, there are way too many people that have gone through that. But through people like yourself being able to talk about it, um, it, it, there, there will be ways to deal with it and, and solutions to find. And also, um, I think people will be able to 
uh, speak up sooner, uh, knowing that other people have been down that road. So I think that's super valuable. So your journey has been quite a, an incredible one, that's for sure. Um, but from Thailand, your journey takes you back to Boise and where you sort of create common good becomes your next venture. So tell us a little bit about how that started and what it, what create uh, common good is. Yeah, well, um, after leaving Bangkok, uh, so my son was born in Bangkok and uh, we went to the East Coast for a couple of years. My husband at the time got his MBA and my daughter was born while we were there. Um, we really thought a lot about what um, we kind of fell in love with Boise, the livability, um, the access to the mountains, um, and really kind of the closeness to the Pacific Northwest that we loved a lot. Um, coming to Boise in 2008 was an interesting time. Uh, my heart was to immediately try to get involved with the refugee community or the international community. And Boise uh, isn't nearly as diverse as, say, Shanghai or, mm-hmm. you know, Atlanta or Bangkok for any, you know, any place really that I, a lot of places I had lived. And yet, um, when I started to really hunt and explore, I learned that the refugee community was sizable in Idaho and that Idaho had been one of the first communities to resettle refugees, um, you know, now 30 years ago plus. And so I quickly got engaged with the refugee community and it was that fall of 2008 when the economy really tanked. And so Idaho, a a place that typically has um, strong employment, um, really crashed. And about half of the refugee families that were living in the community at the time were sort of on the brink of homelessness. And having come off the heels of uh, Nightlight and these other organizations focused on job training, I felt like we could uh, do the same thing with and for the refugee community and really any marginalized community. And we could provide job training um, opportunities and try to marry that with an enterprise base to really support some of the, just some of the revenues needed. And so late in the fall of 2008, it's, uh, what's interesting is we're actually this year um, celebrating our 10 year anniversary with Create Common Good, which is kind of hard to believe, um, but also pretty incredible. And we now, we serve uh, refugees, we serve women at risk, we serve people coming um, out of prison, we serve uh, homeless individuals, we serve really anyone that has a barrier to employment. And we do that through the lens of a food production model. And so we have essentially what we would call a commissary or kind of like an outsourced chop shop Um, We have a food production facility and we service business to business uh, clientele in terms of the food products. So you might own a restaurant or you might um, run a hotel or a grocery store or a gas station and you might have certain food items that maybe require preparation um, that you don't want to do in house. And so we do everything from chop onions for hot dogs to make soups to make salad dressings, um, all kinds of different products now that we make for businesses in the region. And so um, the people who are making those products, um, some of them at times come through our job training program or they may, um, you know, find it harder to find other employment at times. Um, But our job training program uh, works closely with our food production Uh, team. And we also do a lot of healthy feeding across the valley and the region where we live. So providing fresh snacks to kids um, in hard to reach Mm. locations. And so we, we sell products to, you know, generate a revenue base so that we're not raising all the money philanthropically to provide the job training services. So um, we raise about half of our annual revenues um, through the food product sales and, you know, we work with a lot of great employer partners. If you were to come to the airport in Boise, about a third of the people there have come through our job training program and wow. now wow. work at the airport. So, um, you know, we have people who will pay us uh, to be to kind of have first dibs on our people huh. in that they want um, to be able to interview them and have access to great talent. So uh, we have really, um, like every social enterprise, struggled 
every step of the way um, to build you know, a foundation of both excellence and strength. Um, and what's cool is we're now sort of entering a new season really where, you know, we're serving such a broad population of people. Um, but we're also thinking about best ways to scale the job training that we, that we offer. Yeah. I must say what you're doing is so awesome. Um, and yeah. I was checking out your website, like some of the mm -hmm. success stories and, um, I can't remember the, the people's names, but there was a one guy from uh, Syria mm. and um, he came and he did, uh, I think, your, your work training program and worked in, uh, worked in one of the kitchens there. And he basically suffered, I think, from PTSD um, mm. and sort of struggled a little bit uh, with his wife and his family, like, uh, you know, just, I guess, obviously with his own confidence and stuff. But then... You know, he showed the guys um, in the kitchen how to like make pizzas by like flipping them in the <laughs> air, and then like some uh, some more traditional uh, Syrian food, as well as uh, there was a story about him doing like a, a dance in the kitchen, a traditional Syrian dance, which was just <laughs> it was just like really moving, you know. And then and then the guy from uh, the DRC, uh, Democratic um, Republic of Congo. And, um, you know, he was a teacher and then he, uh, he came and he had to sort of retrain when he came to, to America and he trained with you guys. Um, once again, you know, in the kitchen and it's just like such an amazing thing you're doing. You know what I mean? Like you're literally changing people's lives. You must, I don't know, you must have this great sense of like fulfillment from it when you, okay. you know, when people like with people like that come through your sort of program, surely. Well, you know, um, I was so humbled living overseas in China by myself. I didn't know how to buy food, let alone how to live in this community, really, as a um, young, single, naive uh, white girl from the United States. And I, I was so um, struck by the kindness of my Chinese colleagues and Chinese friends and how much they helped me kind of get my feet on the ground and figure out the basics. And um, as I got and got involved with the refugee community in, in Boise in 2008, I would meet teachers, I would meet doctors, I would meet community organizers who couldn't get a job, you know, scrubbing toilets. And I just, I couldn't, um, I really couldn't fathom, like having had a very professional career and not being able to come and find quality employment, let alone not be able to come find any employment. And so mm. as a you know, proud member of this community that I love, I felt like shame on us if we can't create a better mm. way to harness the talents of such a special group of people who's coming to the States um, that we've welcomed. We theoretically have invited um, all of these refugees to live in our country. And when you hear the stories of really any number of the refugees um, who resettle in the United States or any other country around the world for that matter, truly, um, again, as a person who's lived with mostly what I need, my, my whole upbringing, you just cannot fathom um, having had family members killed in front of you or, you know, having, um, you know, experienced rape and abuse just for years and years and years on end. Or, you know, there, there's so many horrific things happening around the world and what most people don't realize is refugees are fleeing something. Yeah. You know, they're not sort of like opting, you know, for they, they've lost their home because of some horrific um, thing that's happening and some awful form of persecution. And so, you know, as I heard these stories, it, it felt that to me, the great number majority of people coming actually have great talent. They have great skills, but they don't necessarily have a good channel to connect to the local employment kind of arena. And so in many ways, while at Create Common Good, it's a, we provide a food service job training program. And it's um, an eight-week program. You spend essentially kind of two months preparing for your job. The reality is we're actually building confidence um, more mm. than anything else. Um, I notice how often people coming through our program, you know, they might have a hard time 
looking you in the eyes or shaking your hand um, or just, you know, kind of um, approaching new people. And you, you can just tell how much someone's confidence and spirit can be broken through the lens of really painful life experiences. And so some of my favorite stories that my heart and mind go to most quickly are people who they may have come in with slum shoulders and hard to like um, communicate with others and, you know, leaving, they were boisterous and, you know, (laughs) kind of strong and um, proud and, you know, shake your hand heartily and, (laughs) you know, just to see someone walk with that, um, you know, is enough to kind of change your own world and how you see things. So, you know, while I think it's pretty special what we do, you know, I always say that it's way better for those of us who get to be a small part of what we do um, with these communities because we're learning so much from the people that we are theoretically serving, you know, and it's, it's changing the way we all um, experience our day-to-day world. And it just, you know, we, we focus on um, gratitude at Create Common Good, and I personally just believe in sort of gratitude as a secret weapon. Um, but I think it's hard not to be grateful for your day-to-day experiences when you're faced with the true reality of, of what so many people um, are living through. And so, you know, we really, we focus on gratitude, we focus on engagement, you know, we try to bring as much of the community into these individuals' lives and, um, and into the organization And, you know, we really try to focus on empowering. So we're not, you know, doing the hard work for these these individuals. Um, They're the ones who are taking a bus, maybe two or three buses to get to training. They're the ones who are biking there. They're the ones who are, you know, applying for the jobs, um, you know, doing the hard work it takes to do entry level employment. Um, And, you know, it's it's our you know, unique opportunity to be there to kind of support alongside as a, you know, teacher, trainer, um, friend, um, but also just to be there to encourage them. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think for those of us that live in the developed world and that have access to education for free, um, you know, we, we just sometimes take for granted how, throughout our whole life, we've probably had people that have been positively, you know, investing in our lives and Mm. encouraging our lives. You know, I I could name five or 10 teachers throughout my, you know, life that really still like they're, you know, they influence me so much. Um, But not everybody has that. Not everybody can go Mm. to school. Not everybody um, has had positive mentorship in their lives or just positive uh, relationships and you know in so many cultures surviving day to day is a lot of work so yes. you know we have so much space and time for like leisure and just you know enjoyment I think um, my life experiences and travel and work um, has just really shown me how privileged um, I am and it also just makes me want to do more you know I mm. um, I'm thinking a lot you know, about the kind of, um, generosity lately and, and just, I want to live generously, like not just with money. Yes. In terms of finance always for sure. But in terms of time, in terms of like words you share with others, um, in terms of, you know, the choices you make, I just, I want to be more mindful of all the places in my world that I can make a conscious choice, um, you know, to be more generous. Uh, and I never, I was telling someone recently, I never regret when I've been generous, you know, Hmm. like there's like, I can't name one situation (laughs) where I I did something that was the more generous choice Mm. and I felt bad about it. Right. So I, I just want to practice that. I want my kids to practice that. I want to try to live that and, and try to model that. Um, and I really believe like we all kind of get by with a little help from our friends. Right. I I think that we're all fortunate to benefit from maybe generations or years and decades of people who've poured into our lives. And so, you know, I, I just want to be able to do the same 
thing. Wow, what a what a amazing story of what it is to be a, a good human being. And like, I, I just can't help just getting a smile on my face hearing you talk like that because I, I just think generosity is is such a great word uh, to use and to think of in any contact point that we have with others. Uh, just you know, use the the thought of generosity, and I think it's so so cool. And so thanks for doing stuff like that because it inspires. I know certainly me. Uh, just to hear people talking like that because we have so much potential to help others and uh, and we have got so much privilege why not share that a little bit you know it's just amazing so on a slightly light, lighter note you, you guys talk about um, how much uh, or how many onions that you guys get through in a, in a, is, is that a fair, a fair to- <laughs> I mean, yeah, we tons and tons of onions. I, I, I don't even know what the exact number is right now. But I want to say, you know, somewhere between like 30 and 60 tons of onions <laughs> wow. every year that we chop. And, yes. uh, <laughs> and that's a lot of onions. Um, oh, wow. A lot and, of crying. And are you chopping yeah, them? Are you crying. chopping them just with a, a knife? Or have you got a machine or like? You know, we have different kind of tools and equipment it's not just with a knife there are some piece of equipment where you can sort of chop an onion (laughs) a little bit more efficiently but (laughs) you know to your point there's a lot of crying in the kitchen Um, (laughs) what's actually entertaining and I was joking with another friend who used to work with us at Create Come Good and she's a really fantastic chef and she was offering a fun cooking lesson to my kids and I. And um, my son was chopping up onions and and asking about the crying and we were kind of laughing because throughout the years at Create Common Good, different cultures have kind of different ways they avoid crying when they <laughs> chop onion. So one of our favorite stories was about a woman, uh, Rosa, who is, uh, I think Rosa's from Ethiopia, and she would put a, a bit of an onion behind her ear. <laughs> and she swore that that's why she never cried, because she had a little bit of an onion <laughs> behind oh, her cool. ear. <laughs> so if you're wondering, you're in the kitchen, you know, later um, this week or month, and you want to experiment, you try. can try out Rosa's <laughs> theory. Yeah. <laughs> That's classic. I, I remember I walking into the kitchen once at my friend's house and he had like goggles on. And I was like, <laughs> Bud, what have you got goggles on for? He's like, no, I'm busy trying to cut some onions. So my eyes don't water. It's just like <laughs> taking it to another level. <laughs> so crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, well, that's actually yeah. what my friend uh, Michelle, Chef Michelle would say is wear some goggles. Yeah. It really helps. Yeah, he's on to something. It's interesting because I I actually um, just finished uh, studying to be a chef like very recently, mm. and um, our chef was like a our, our, one of our teachers was a proper sort of uh, cordon bleu type of guy, like French uh, oh. French chef, and he taught us how to cut onions, and he was he was like, no, if you cut it this way, then your eyes definitely will not water. But I can confirm that that is definitely not the truth as well. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter how many tra- oh, times crazy. I tried to do it his way, my eyes will always water. Maybe they're just super <laughs> sensitive or something. <laughs> um, yeah, I think most of us um, yeah. have that same experience, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, sorry, Tara, like, um, it's, it's amazing how, like, this helpfulness uh, just runs in your sort of blood, you know. It's, it's just this sort of theme which carries on throughout uh, your your whole life and you know like now you've moved on to um fathom uh which is uh, like a crew well you, you can tell us more about it but from my understanding it's like a a cruise sort of um trip where people come and they they uh, as part of the cruise they get to sort of integrate with um you know communities on the stops and things like that and help people and it's just to me, it seems like such an awesome thing. You know, you get to have a holiday, but then you also get to sort of, you know, give back and, um, you know, get, get something out of it uh, that way. So, yeah, can you just um, tell us a little bit about what that is, please? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, well, I think, you know, back to, again, kind of the, the topic of generosity, I think um, what generosity requires is like true human connection, right? And it requires... Um, like recognizing an awareness, you know, of somebody else. Um, Fathom is really about unleashing human potential for meaningful impact. And 
we really believe in this idea of deep human experiences. And so we say that fathom experiences are kind of travel deep experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're really about helping people connect, um, helping people more deeply unite and sort of inspiring them to be part of something that's bigger. And so we are, um, you know, pretty interesting and unique in that uh, Fathom is part of the world's largest travel and leisure company, which is Carnival Corporation. And so as the Carnival family, we're actually 10 different global brands. So we have um, nine sister cruise line brands. We have uh, Princess, we have uh, Seaborn, we have Carnival, we have Holland America, and Fathom is five the north we also have cunard piano uk aida costa and piano australia um so our sisters are all true cruise lines and fathom um we really got started as kind of a a a different kind of company within the family our focus is really about designing um developing and delivering you know, really meaningful uh, experiences for travelers in and through really any one of our sister cruise lines. And so uh, in the first season, we developed, we repurposed a small ship of about 700 passengers, and we developed a seven-day experience. We called a social impact travel experience where you could participate with us in what we believe is an opportunity to kind of give and play and grow. So to your point, it's a, um, it is a fun trip, a fun holiday, um, but it also has a depth to it that is a bit different. So, you know, our onboard experiences, we have fun um, enriching workshops like Curiosity Advantage and Mindfulness Workshops and Design Your Life for Impact or um, Unique Storytelling Workshops. So there's a lot of like rich content that really helps our travelers kind of grow themselves. Um, and then on shore, when you travel to the locations um, we go with us, you know, our travelers participate with locals um, in the things that matter and mean the most to them. So sometimes that's a, um, you know, a, a women's cooperative where our travelers learn to make organic chocolate and kind of help support the production of a women's cooperative in the Dominican Republic. Sometimes it's a farm to table experience where our travelers get to go to a local farm and learn about um, the local growing culture and participate in a sustainable agriculture experience with local families and then, you know, partake in the harvest and partake in a meal. Um, We believe a lot in this idea of heightening human connections and really coming alongside uh, local friends. So we don't see it as, you know, a bunch of people heading to do things for another culture as much as we see it as an opportunity for our travelers to go and participate with local um, new friends. You know, we see it as an opportunity to learn, to really immerse in a place. And then potentially there are ways that a traveler might serve that community as well. But we think there's so much um, needed just in your own spirit and posture to really just see that we have so much to learn from other cultures. And while sure they might like our help with some things, um, truly there's a lot we can learn and gain from our experiences yeah. with them as well. So we now offer Fathom experiences uh, in and through our nine sister cruise lines. Um, we have trips where you can participate in say a seven or 10 day cruise experience. Um, and you might be able to go to three or four different locations and on the ground participate in, you know, any number of experiences from an arts therapy experience to a unique Rastafarian drum circle to um, a unique experience with elders in Mexico. So we've got all kinds of cool things. We think some people really kind of like have like a head orientation, some have like a hand orientation and some have kind of like a heart orientation. Mm-hmm. So some people just want to go and like sweat and like, you know, plant <laughs> some trees and they yeah. really love <laughs> our, maybe our beach cleanups or our reforestation efforts. Um, some people have a real strong desire to like leave with like a real connection with one person. And so, you know, those people might really enjoy some of the more educational or children and family focused experiences that we offer. 
And then some, you know, really like to just kind of like be, you know, intellectually challenged and working in more of like an intellectually challenging, um, you know, environment. So we, you know, we try to provide experiences that kind of meet people in different places. Um, so really it works for any number of ages. You know, we now have, uh, you know, people taking usually kids, um, get engaged around the age of eight, um, in some of the on ground opportunities, but it really is for, you know, young people to, you know, my, my, uh, grandfather just turned 94 and he and his wife, wow. um, participated on an experience with us, you know, a few years oh, cool. ago. So we have no age discrimination. Um, and we really believe everybody can kind of participate, um, in some way that's meaningful for them and for us. What an incredibly, uh, amazing initiative. I think it's so, so smart to, to combine the two, you know, like even just hearing you speak about kids, I mean, instead of just going, we're just going to go and cruise and I don't know, swim and drink or whatever people, I've never been on a cruise, you know, a lot of people would do that, but at least in this scenario, I mean, you, your kids are having a great time. You're getting away as a family, but you still like sitting there and you're learning together as a family and you're contributing and it just, even on your holidays, you can create this idea of compassion and generosity. And, and I think it's, yeah, I mean, people naturally are need some sort of a little bit of coercion into, or a little bit of a push in the right direction of that kind of thing. And I think that's why it's so smart to combine it. So what, what a great initiative there. So, um, what is the, the plan forward, um, for, for your, this initiative and, and perhaps others? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, we, we think uh, to some of the comments that you were making that it has to be pretty easy for people to engage with things that are kind of foreign or unfamiliar. And so we try to make it really easy for people to just kind of take baby steps and become, you know, exposed to and involved with things that might be different than things they would do back home. Um, we do believe that the education happens in and through the experience. So we kind of think you got to come off the sidelines as a spectator and participate if you really want, um, you know, to gain and grow in different ways. Um, we're now offering these trips kind of in and throughout the Caribbean. We've been heavily focused in the Caribbean, especially post hurricane season last year. I'm not sure how big of news it was where you are, but, um, the hurricane season in the Caribbean was just, um, horrifically devastating this last year with hurricane, uh, Maria and hurricane Irma. And so we're partnered with several of the countries in the Caribbean and have unique experiences that uh, try to support and come alongside those communities. Um, Princess Cruise Line is our first kind of cruise line partner where you can now um, kind of take full fathom experiences in and through uh, Princess Cruise Lines. Um, any one of our other sister brands offers the on-ground experiences that we've brought to life. Um, but now with Princess, you can actually take a full trip with a Fathom guide and Fathom workshops on board, as well as the on-ground experiences. So we're looking at really scaling that in and through, um, you know, Princess um, and then potentially other sister lines. Uh, you know, our goal would be to have these travel deep experiences in any geography location that we go. And really, we kind of we travel the world, you know, corporately, we touch about 700 plus locations. So we've got to. We got a ways to go, um, but you'll first most likely see them in the Caribbean and then probably in the Alaska region. Um, I've been fortunate to spend a bit of time, not enough yet, but down in Sydney and working a little bit with our team there. And, you know, we see the South Pacific um, as, you know, a huge opportunity area. And we do a lot of work through and with p Australia, as well as with all the brands that are in Australia, Princess and Holland and Carnival. Um, we do a lot of work to support the smaller and developing islands, um, places like Vanuatu. You know, we have jobs that we've created. We buy supplies from the island. We bring a lot of travelers there for, you know, commerce and different experiences. So, you know, again, as a new to the industry person myself over the last um, several years, you know, it's it's awesome to see the ways that our cruise travel helps develop local economies. And, um, you know, we try to do um, what we can, and we always need to do an even better job of just being community partners to any of the locations that we might visit. And, 
making sure we're really listening well and mm-hmm. that we understand the things that that matter to those communities um, and then, you know, exploring what, what we might call like the shared value space, which is ways that we can kind of find mutual ground where maybe um, we can serve and support one another towards our own mutual goals. Um, so, you know, we've got a big part of uh, what we're doing at Fathom around what we call these kind of like community solutions minded experiences. And then a whole other part of our organization is focused on experience design. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, companies like IDEO, but we do a lot of kind of um, strategic thought partnership and just experience design um, with and for our sister cruise lines and brands as well. So um, initiative in the Caribbean with Princess, um, we have a team that's been working on kind of a whole new um experience design opportunity for their cruises. And so we're always looking for ways um, to find these kind of connection points and to really heighten those connections and deepen those connections. Uh, We believe in this idea of kind of human-centered design. So really looking at the customer and the traveler first and trying to almost like build and design backwards um, for the unique needs of the travelers and the customers. So, um, so yeah, we stay busy and, you know, we have things going, um, you know, in lots of places. And, you know, I just feel um, we have a pretty awesome corporation. We're such a global, diverse company with locations all over the world. And for me as a person who is kind of hungry to work with a very multicultural um, team and organization, it, you know, it's it's hard to imagine, um, you know, many companies or organizations that have as much diversity and platform reach as we do. You know, we have mm-hmm. about 120,000 employees, um, you know, coming out of countries all over the world, dozens and dozens and dozens of countries um, with offices all over. So, um, you know, it's been fun uh, getting to, you know, taste and experience so many new things and learn so many new things um, with such a global team. Yeah. That's, that's so sorry just, just one just one second um craig do you want to just run off bud because i know you've got to go hit hit uh hit the office um so let's do that maybe because i've I've, got to yeah yeah you've got to get to work (laughs) craig has to run to work so that's cool but you run off and then uh and then we'll just finish up this is the first this is the first bud hey (laughs) yeah this is yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) all right guys all right have a good day buddy see you later thanks guys thanks tara see ya bye cool bye so so yeah just what a couple of interesting like things that are that like i find very interesting um you you mentioned that you were one of the first sort of uh, cruise liners to go to cuba um mm. what what was that like have you been on any of those yourself or and, and how did you kind of set that up yeah well um we're really fortunate uh that we were carnival corporation the first kind of North American cruise line to um, revisit Cuba in more than 40 years. So Fathom, uh, we had just really kind of launched and we're building our our product in the Caribbean region. And we were first focused in the Dominican Republic when President Obama at the time kind of changed some of the travel regulations, making it possible to potentially apply for a license um, to travel to Cuba. And so we applied and um, received acceptance to be able to travel to Cuba. And it was our great honor to be able to build out um, a really unique and meaningful seven day experience uh, traveling to Cuba. Um, We offered trips, um, seven day trips to three different locations in Cuba and uh, you know, I'll never forget our first sailing. I was on board and we had, you know, media from just ever, every major, um, kind of news and media company, uh, across North America, it felt like, and especially in the space of travel and and business and news, um, you know, pulling into Havana Harbor for the first time, it had this unbelievably symbolic, um, and just like, I don't know, spiritual um, weight to it because uh, for as close as Cuba is to the United States, um, you know, it's been many decades that the two have been really disconnected. And 
Um, and there are so many people, especially in South Florida, who come from Cuban descent or Cuban ancestry or who had to leave years ago. And so it was really emotional um, pulling in and being able to sort of kind of symbolically help reunite the cultures. Um, we had people on board with us that first week. We offered trips that hadn't been back since they left as babies or wow. young, young children. And, you know, they were able to walk off the ship into uh, Old Havana and go find their birth homes for no the way. first time, you know, entire adult life. And so the stories that we heard were just crazy. Um, and it was, you know, we're, we were very, very fortunate. Um, there was a regulation not allowing Cuban-born um citizens in the United States to return to Cuba on board the ship. But um, we were fortunate uh, to help get a, a, uh, that regulation changed. So actually Cuban-born um, Americans were able to return to Cuba with us. And there was really um, no discrimination. And we felt um, very strongly about making sure that opportunity was available for anyone who wanted to go. And so um, some pretty historic milestones, yeah, um, you know, wow. president Obama, um, did kind of an entrepreneurship summit in March of what must've been 2000, I think six, no, 15, probably may have been 16. I'm trying to think, um, no, it, it would have been 15, I believe when we were down getting, um, our kind of Cuban approval. Because you have to, we had to actually go through uh, quite a bit to get approval on both the U.S. side and the Cuban side to be able to, um, you know, take these trips and to do business. And so, actually, it was in 2016, March of 2016. Um, so we were down there. There was a, a group of different business executives from all kinds of industries and companies who were hoping and trying to get approval to do business in Cuba, um, but such a historic time. And, and for me to be able to be there and, you know, I met President Obama, um, met um, leaders from all kinds of companies. And it was cool that we were sort of all there focused on creating broader opportunity for the Cuban people. Wow, that's so amazing. I can imagine like, well, I'm picturing in my mind, like when you sort of dock the ship that there's like families and that waiting and maybe flags flying and, and like lots of tears thousands and stuff. of people thousands. lots of wow. tears people were there were thousands of people in the streets lining um the kind of um malacone in havana but kind of like the the side of the canal where we were coming in and people were waving you know u.s flags and cuban flags and dancing and and they were out all day long into the night. I remember not getting back to my room until really, really late after a busy day of media and interviews and meetings. And I remember going out to my balcony and noticing pitch black at night, you know, midnight or something. And there were people still just dancing on the streets um, with joy. And so, yeah, there's some wonderful photos um, that were captured during that time. And, and to me, you know, people asked about kind of the social impact component of what we were doing in Cuba. And, you know, the question I, I found myself re replying with is how do you really quantify hope? You know, we, we saw and felt and experienced um, hope at a level. We just, um, you know, it, it was such a power. Yeah. The whole thing was so powerful. And now, um, you know, several of our brands have the opportunity to travel to Cuba now because of, um, what we did and you know it's it's been an interesting time that are now uh, doing business globally that maybe never had sold products outside of cuba until we went and so a lot of meaningful progress um and yet still huge challenges um in the country but glad to see um there is you know been kind of a weaving of relationship back together to some extent yeah, that's so amazing. Like coming from South Africa, I know that uh, so much hope is created when there's that sort of reconciliation, you know, and I can imagine that was a sort of big reconciling period. What was it like when people left? It must have been just as emotional, I can imagine. 
it, yeah, it was a really powerful trip. I mean, the whole experience was really powerful. Um, you know, for all the people that went, I think that, you know, still to this day, people who were on that first trip talk about how it was one of the most memorable experiences of their life. Um, you know, I think it's something none of us will forget. We got off the ship and were immediately taken into meetings with some of the, the local Cuban ministers and the traveler base um, entered into the streets of Old Havana. And there were, there was just a huge, almost like a parade of people dancing, singing, crying, and just hugging every traveler that came. Mm. And so, um, yeah, people, people described it as surreal, really just walking out into this huge celebration and huge reception. Um, yeah, it, it was a magnificent moment for sure. Yeah, I can imagine there must be some really cool photos and videos of that whole occasion. Like, uh, for sure. Yeah, it'd be cool to see. So, so yeah, just to sort of um, finish it, finish this up. Uh, if people want to uh, get hold of you um, or support you and support your businesses, uh, what's the best way for them to sort of find out um, about them and yourself? Yeah, well, um, probably the best way to find me or anything about. Um, the work that we do is to look us up online. Um, you can learn more about Create Common Good uh, on the web at www.createcommongood.org. Um, you can find more about Fathom at fathom, F-A-T-H-O-M dot org. Um, and you can find me on Twitter um, or on Instagram, usually uh, most easily socially. Okay, that's awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Like we we put a lot of uh, show notes together and obviously we will put everything in there so people can get hold of you. Is it, is there like, can people, uh, support, um, uh, create common good by like volunteering and things like that? Is that an option for them too? Yeah. So, um, we are always interested in and eager to have new volunteers and so people can, uh, get involved, you know, with their time People can donate online easily from anywhere in the world. Um, and people can also come experience uh, some of the things that we offer. We offer really unique supper club events, which are kind of um, cool. fancy dinners within our production kitchen where our trainees share their stories. And we have local celebrity chefs who come and um, put on uh, you know, the meal with our trainees um, for our guests. So if you ever get over to Boise, you'll have to come and be yeah. a, a local local guest uh, or a, a global guest chef <laughs> yeah that sounds like a good plan i'd love to do that actually um we'll have to try and uh, organize that um wow. so, so so yeah so you know that just on behalf of uh, craig and i we always just like to to say thank you to our guests and, and craig has obviously had to skirt off and, and run to the office to, uh, right now um so it's just been such an amazing chat. Um, first of all, thanks for um, coming on the podcast. You know, um, it was really nice of Diane to to give the introduction, and you know, we were so excited to chat to you when we started pulling together your storyboard because we could see that there was like so many cool things that you were doing. And apologies if we like sort of moved across things too quickly in the chat i was just kind of conscious that uh, craig was uh, craig was a bit limited on time but also yeah. that there were so many cool things that you were doing that was that were worth mentioning you know and it's for me and i think for the listeners it's so great to hear people that are doing good stuff people that are contributing people that are um, creating value and you know, you're doing it like from such a great place and you, you're changing people's lives like and, and that's and that's just so awesome. You know what I mean? It's not something that you can put like uh, like a financial label on or anything whatsoever. You, you truly like going much deeper than that. And, you know, in terms of being ridiculously human, that is like one of the most ridiculously human things there is out there. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, it truly is touching and uh, you know any way that we can as as hosts get involved and, and for our listeners listeners if they can get involved um, they, they definitely will um, so so yeah your story is great what you're doing is absolutely awesome 
we're, we're super excited, you know, um, just to hear it, but also to sort of follow this journey and see where it goes. Um, cause I can imagine you have, you know, so many other great ideas out there, um, being the entrepreneur you are. And, uh, you know, we just, uh, wish you all the success going forward. And, um, just thanks again for, for giving us so much of your time. Um, you know, being such a busy lady, we really do appreciate it. Yeah, Gareth, it's um, been really a special treat to be with you guys. Um, you know, we're all sort of in this together. And I appreciate your willingness to share a little bit more about the work that we're doing. Um, so thanks for having me on. It's been fun. And uh, maybe someday you'll get a chance to visit Boise, Idaho. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, it sounds like a great place. And, and from the look of it, uh, Craig and I could definitely live there. So <laughs> we'll have to visit at least um and uh, definitely um, hook up and can come, come meet you and see you in person. That'd be great. Cool. Listen, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me on, Gareth. No, that's cool. Yeah, thank you so much, Tara, and hope you have a great rest of the day too. All right, take care. Cool. Cheers, eh? Bye-bye.